If Turner's philosophy on the trappings of empire seems radical, it is useful to note that he was not alone in his beliefs. His beliefs were influenced by the politics and the poetry of his day. As I mentioned previously, Napoleon invaded Switzerland while Turner was planning a snowstorm. Understandably, the British Parliament condemned the invasion. But Turner, rather than joining the politicians of his day in condemnation, chose instead to throw light on another infamous time in Britain's own sordid imperial past, King Edward Longshanks I's invasion and bloody domination of the Welsh. Edward invaded and took control of the lands in Wales from 1270 to 1290 AD. He built a series of castles dubbed the Iron Ring to ensure that he would not have to fight more wars to maintain control of his newly conquered lands. Turner painted Dolbadurn Castle in 1800. He attached an unattributed poem imitative of Thomas Gray's The Bard in which he recalled the 20-year imprisonment of Owen Gok in the castle tower. How awful is the silence of the waste, where nature lifts her mountains to the sky. Majestic solitude, behold the tower, where hopeless Owen, long imprisoned, pined, and wrung his hands for liberty in vain. The artist exhibit Cavernian Castle in the same year with another unattributed poem attached. And now, on Arvon's haughty towers, the bard, the song of pity pours, for oft on Mona's distant hills he sighs, where jealous of the minstrel band, the tyrant drenched with blood the land, and charmed with horror triumphed in their cries. The swains of Arvon round him throng and join the sorrows of his song. Turner chose to draw attention to England's own sordid imperial past rather than cre to create paintings condemning Napoleon. He points to the viewer to look inward and to be critical of his own government and realize the trappings of empire. Turner's feelings were surely influenced by his patron and friend, Sir Walter Ramsden Fox. Fox was a member of Parliament with radical views. On May 23, 1812, shortly after the exhibition of Snowstorm, Fox gave his speech on parliamentary reform in which he called for the restoration of the Constitution. He warned that the country was in crisis because the Constitution allowed for imperial domination, that it must be reformed or a civil war must occur to reform it. He summed up, Power I do covet, but it is only the power would I had it to point out distinctly to my countrymen the brink of the frightful precipice on which they are trembling and the necessity of their withdrawing themselves from its hollow and crumbling edge. Fox warning was a recognition of ills brought on domestic and foreign lands by imperial might. Turner certainly heard his political views during trips to visit Fox home, Farnley Hall. Another political influence was the use of the sun as political imagery during the century leading up to Turner's productive career. In the 17th century, Louis XIV surrounded himself with imagery of Apollo and called himself the Sun King. During the middle of the 18th century, the king and church became darkness, and a sense of light was shifted to enlightenment and individual human reason. At the time of the French Revolution, the Reverend Richard Rice made a speech in which he said, I see the ardor for liberty catching and spreading. Behold the light you have struck out, after setting America free, reflected to France, and they are kindled into a blaze that lays despotism in ashes, and warms and illuminates all of Europe. Tremble, all ye oppressors of the world. You cannot now hold the world in darkness. Struggle no longer against the increasing light and liberality. Turner's use of the sun in his Carthaginian-based paintings reflects the cyclical processes of empire. His rising sun in Dido-building Carthage symbolizes rising empire. The midday sun and snowstorm suggest the culmination of a mighty empire. Turner expresses decline in the sunset of the decline of the Carthaginian Empire. Turner uses the familiar political imagery of the sun as a suggestion that all empires are destined to fail and follow the natural cyclical pattern of life. Ronald Paulson says that Turner transforms this political sun into a literal fire in the burning of the Houses of Parliament, 1835 destroying the seat of the English government in the same kind of gesture Guy Fox once planned. These political influences nurtured Turner's growing disillusionment with the trappings of empire. We find even greater influence in the poetry Turner admired. 
Turner gained courage, direction, and dynamic conceptions from poetry. Jack Lindsay writes in J.M.W. Turner, His Life and Work, that poetry deeply affected Turner and that his ideas and impulses in the sphere of art are inseparable from his ideas and impu impulses in the sphere of poetry. It is interesting to note Gerald Ziff's research in Turner's library. He concluded that Turner's Fallacies of Hope was heavily influenced by John Langcord's Visions of Fancy and Hymn to Hope. In both works, Langhorne used the phrase fallacious hope. Ziff says that Turner was deeply influenced by these works found in his library at the time of his death. Throughout his career, Turner attached poetry to his paintings. In his younger years, they were quoted passages from other poets, but later, most were his own verses. His library had a copy of Dr. Anderson's works of the British poets in the titles of several pictures, which date from 1798 to 1802, Turner quotes or refers to the poetry of Langhorne, Milton, Thomson, Millay, and Atkinside. Their complete poetical output is included in Anderson. Furthermore, in volumes 12 and 13, every classical source cited or quoted by Turner in the titles of pictures, Homer, Ovid, and Virgil, can be found in Anderson. It is possible that the pages of Anderson contain many answers to problems in Turner's pictorial subject matter and his poetical activities. The pictorial poet James Thompson most strongly influenced Turner on the subject of imperialism. Thompson's poem Liberty embodies liberty in an allegorical goddess who descends upon ancient Rome, rises and descends again upon Italy in the Renaissance, rises again and then descends upon the British Empire. Part 5 of the poems predicts how a nation will fall if it neglects science, art, and public works, which complete the fabric of liberty. It raised a typical question of Turner's epoch. How long could a great mercantile empire resist corruption? Turner searched for the answer to this question. Why did the Greco-Roman civilization break down? Thompson's poem made the reader wonder if the British Empire would decline in greed and corruptions, ceasing to exist as so many had before. Lindsay notes that Turner looked to Thompson's poetry for inspiration and for verification of his impulses. Turner wanted to turn the landscape into something more powerful. He wanted to make the landscape mean something to the viewer, as he felt it should. Romantic poets and painters began to turn away from the adage of ut pictura poesis, or as is painting, so is poetry. To do that, the poets of Turner's time, and especially Thompson, began to write pictorical poetry. They began to write about landscape as if it were a series of pictures. Thompson's 1730 poem, The Seasons, was a major treatment of life and the rhythm of the external world. Its descriptions of landscape were vivid enough to win the special admiration of both Turner and Constable, and it probably did more than any other poem of its time to create a public taste for the poetry of landscape. Significantly, it did so largely by representing landscape as if it were a series of pictures. What for an earlier poet would be bright, for Thompson, is brightening. He wants the image that impacts and expresses motion and change. Thompson created a new dynamic intensity of image in his poems, which moved Turner to draw the primary basis of his aesthetic. Turner moved beyond mere topography and naturalistic genre. What Turner began to create was a dynamic image, one filled with change and atmospheric transformation. Just as Thompson's poetry portrayed landscape as an evolving living thing, so did Turner's paintings. This poetic influence brought him to find the device by which he would express his disillusionment with empire, the swirling vortex of change. Snowstorm serves as Turner's warning to his society about the trappings of empire, conquest, and domination. Turner undermines imperialism, conveys a social message, and makes his art a bearer of ideology to serve political ends. Turner defies influences upon landscape and history painting. He enables his work to reflect a decaying society and attempts to change the world.